Hello and welcome to the meat shop. Thanks for clicking on. My name's Duncan Henry and in a few moments I'm going to take you out of the meat shop and we're going to head over to the corner butcher to visit Sam England who's going to show us how to break and cut and wrap beef without using a bandsaw. So if you don't have a bandsaw at home and you want to know how to cut and wrap some beef or get some pointers, tips and tricks, this is the video for you. So without any further ado, off we go to the corner butcher. All right, I'm just gonna introduce Sam here real quick. This is Sam from The Corner Butcher. Uh, he's gonna have us here today for a demo on breaking beef the old school way when he learned when he was 16, so. Yep, yeah, so here we go. So we split between the ninth and 10th rib. So that was the ninth and 10th rib if my camera didn't catch. This isn't how normal people do it, but this is how I was taught to do it. <laughs> Where'd you go to school, Sam? Where'd you learn? I learned in a village butcher shop in the East, uh, Cranswick in the East Riding of Yorkshire, England. I never went to school. I got learnt on the block. <laughs> in mean, them days, they were actually blocks. <laughs> Yeah, we had our little village butcher shop, we had our own slaughterhouse. And, and it's still running today. It's under a new ownership, but it uh, slaughterhouse is still going. It's the only one in the area now. But yeah, when I was a kid growing up, we had six slaughterhouses around the old town. Now there's just the one left. So then, just to separate the loin from the leg. We have to find the pig bone. Just miss the hip bone. Alright, so you got the flank and the loin together there. That's cool. And just for everyone watching, so Sam runs a custom butcher and meat shop, so this is going to go back to a farmer, right Sam? He's got a set of cutting instructions yeah. for you. It's only inspected meat. It's only for his own, it's only for his own consumption. So the front goes back off into the cooler to stay cool till Sam is ready to get at it. So remove the flank of the belly section from the wire. And that's the navel, kind of the midline, a bit dirty where the gutter will open it up sometimes. That is a nice handsaw. I've never seen a blade that thick on one. That's a beef splitting blade. They're awesome. They're the ones are way too flimsy. You get them from Alphans. Okay. Yeah, they're so this gentleman, he wants New Yorks and ribeyes, boneless, so we remove the tenderloin.
then we burn it out. Everyone's going to want to know, Sam, what's your go-to knife brand? Well, at the moment, Victory Knives <laughs> out in New Zealand. Oh, you like Victories, yeah? Yeah, they're, they're reasonably priced and so far they've been good. I go through a lot, so... Mm -hmm. I've used the, the I've used Victorinox and I've used Dick and these are just as good. Not many people burn these out individually. No, this is new technique to me. see me do it like this they think I'm old-fashioned oh well <laughs> I am old <laughs> I was taught by uh, two old butchers I was, they were probably in the 60s when I was 16. We had our own slaughterhouse and we used to split beef with a cleaver. <laughs> you used to split beef with a cleaver? Yeah. Holy. That would be a lot of work. <laughs> we used to split lambs and pigs with a cleaver too. We had a splitting saw, but we weren't allowed to use it. <laughs> Customers gotta like this though, because this boning them out the way you've boned them out that's increases your yield on your prime cut, right? True, yeah. Just gotta remember not to dig your knife in too far, just use the tip of them. You say it's trimming. These bones are pearly white, as you can see. <laughs> then I decided to do this because I was stupid. No. I've never been happier, actually. Yeah? I used to buy it. When I was a part of the park, I looked after 13 farms. You managed 13 pork farms before this? Well, we had, um, we had the cell band from Grimby, and then we had, uh, we had feeder operations where they fi finished them. So I did 13, I had 13 feeder bands. Sheesh. 42,000 pigs on the floor. 42,000 pigs. So the key to happiness is the opening up a meat shop, is what you're saying? Yeah, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd less stress anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice looking loin, Sam. Got the those perfect little divots in there. You've never seen one bone like that before? No, I've never seen a bone out like that before. You pop each vertebrae off individually. And you take your chain muscle off? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I don't know what you <laughs> What do you call that big yellow tendon that extends kind of from the ribeye down to the atlas joint there? I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> Everyone calls it something different, so. We used to call it 
<coughs> cat meat, there's even a cat can eat it, but I don't know, I've heard it called paddy whack. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know, I just call it plumber gristle. Yeah, it's very gristle, yeah. We call it the tally whack at the shop. And when we were at old college, we would take those and dry them off and whip each other with them. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you make good dog treats. If you dry them off and they could like a rawhide sort of thing. <laughs> Actually, years ago in England, they used to um, dry the penises out. Oh, yeah. Stretch them and yeah. dry them out. And used to use them for stop sticks, sticks for like... Oh, for the cattlemen, yeah. And then you ban them because they would actually be hitting too hard, you would split the skin on a cow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they used to hang them from the rafters and tie them, rock, uh, a brick to the end of them and stretch them, so... Yeah, that was... So then they just want some ribeye sticks. Okay. Here comes the ribeyes. There we go. A little bit of a leaner beef, eh? Yeah, no, it is. We get from leaner than this to unbelievably fat, so. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the part and parcel of doing custom cutting of beef. Eh? You can get cows with broken legs or yeah. nice 4-H beef that have two inches of fat on them. Or yeah. yeah, I know. It's, yeah, you got to do with what you can, what you have to dealt with. But then they want some New Yorks. There's your boneless New York strip steak right there. A year December. Really? Yeah. You booked a full year in advance for custom cutting. There you go. If you're watching this and you need something to do, <laughs> go borrow a million dollars and build a meat shop and you'll be busy for years. The rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what you take. I think that's what this place will be cost now. Knocking all that kidney fat off, it's kind of tallowy when it gets cooked up, so. It's not much left of a tenderloin by the time you get it cleaned up, eh? No. No, not really. That's probably why it comes. So much damn money. <laughs> yeah. Personally, I'd rather be I'd rather leave it before I choose other stuff to eat before this. Yes. There we go, and there's your best cuts off the animal, the ribeye, the tenderloin, and the strip loin. So there's not too many cuts we typically save off the flank in Canada. I think it's because we're kind of spoiled. But do you, uh, do you like any cuts off the flank, Sam? Yeah, the flank steak is good. And even the inside skirt steak. Is all right too, but no, I'm majority of it usually goes into hamburger, ground or stew meat. You can take keep the ribs too if you want to do them for barbecue and do that a little bit. More people are getting into smoking ribs and stuff like that. But it's, this gentleman doesn't want his, so it's all going into hamburger. Yeah, and that kind of diaphragm, I don't know if it's technically diaphragm, but pulling that off, because that's even tough in the burger, correct? Yeah, yeah, I know it is. It's like a membrane. And sometimes it comes off easy. And sometimes it's like this. It doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> this is a pretty lean cow, it's probably why. Uh, that's your London broil too, right? The skirt steak? Similar, same name, different retail name? Uh, 
I don't know, because Wunderbro... People call Wunderbro from different places. A lot of it comes, a lot of them take the London boil off the inside grounds. But oh. it's, it's more of a skirt steak, inside skirt steak, which is actually this bit here. Right, that's yeah. Yeah. It's good in fajitas, stir fry and stuff. As it makes good stew as well. I think the people now in life are using more more of the cheaper cuts. They're getting more popular because they're they are cheaper just to barbecue and stuff like that. Yeah. You get a, for the last couple of years there's been more requests for plank steak. So it's good for it's good for stir fries, but it's good for fajitas and stuff like that. And a lot of places they'll butterfly them. Hmm. Roll them. And make the pinwheels. Oh yes, those are popular. Yeah. But this one is burger today. <laughs> yeah. Burger today. For a spoiled Albertans. Yeah. And the key to the flank is kind of just there's all those seams between each cut that Sam's going at and if you start at the bottom of one, you kind of you can see Sam's lifting with his hand and just making the marks with his knife where he needs to, and that just peels all the lean meat out of all that sinew, connective tissue, and it's kind of like the belly of the beef. Is it the beef breathes that expands and contracts, and that's what all that membrane type stuff is there for. That is a very nice, lean, gristle-free meat tote. That's especially coming off of the flank. And even with it being so lean, Sam says he uses a gristle extractor on his grinder, which is neat. But, uh, so it gets even, even more gristle-free. This is the remainder of the flank here, the few bones off the, the hind end of the beef. I'd say you probably go above and beyond what most butchers do on extracting the gristle sound. That's something else. Oh, I don't know. It's just the way I was sure how to do it, I guess. <laughs> you could probably get an extra two beef cut a day if you did it like everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, probably. <laughs> then you'd hear from your customers twice as often when you didn't want to about gristle in the meat, so. Yeah. Then I'd have to build bigger coolers, and then I'd have the wife on my case because I was spending too much money. So. <laughs> <laughs> she'd be on my case because she'd have to work. She'd have to wrap twice as much. So. Is she coming in today, kind of halfway through this, or? Well, she doesn't usually get here until two o'clock. Knowing her today, she's going to be late because she don't want to be on camera. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. She gave me strict orders yesterday. No swearing, don't be dropping. If you drop your knife, make sure you wash it. And... <laughs> Good. Yes. Okay, off to fetch the next piece. A little trap door for the rail. Looks like we're working on the hip. Okay. Got a, there's a bump there, and just above the bump, you can get right into the joint. I can assure you it's not as easy as he makes it look. <laughs> So with a shin, like this gentleman doesn't want it, but you can make soup bones out of it. You can slice it, saw it up, and then you get, slap, you get the meat, the shin meat, and the marrow bone. And it's also called osabuka. Yeah. But few people get that, but not many. You can make it in a stew, but it makes it awesome. Soup bones and stew and that, especially if you leave the bone on, because shins are full of connective tissue and gristle. 
and it just melts away. But whereas, as, as Duncan says, we're spoiled Albertans. <laughs> That's true, we got lots of beef. Machine's actually not too bad of a piece to bone out. Once you get your knife right on the edge of that bone, it kind of, there's a seam underneath and that is a nice clean. And then we remove the sirloin. So, I was always told there's three fingers and go like that. Sirloin, tenderloin, sirloin tip. Remove the sirloin tip, and this isn't how normal people do it, so. <laughs> Just follow the theme of burn down. the oyster steak. There's only two of them on an animal. And uh, don't look like much but it sure tastes good. You gotta cook them very hot and very quickly. Medium medium. Just because they're so thin? Well if you take them too hot or to cook them too long they'll be tough. This is a lot of quite a lot of connected gristle in it. Okay. But if you uh, put them on for about maybe three minutes, flip them a couple of times, get your grill up to about six, seven hundred degrees. Ooh, steaming. So in theory, it looks like an oyster shell. And you kind of shuck it out of the like a like like you chuck an oyster. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Well, this gentleman done one, so we're doing the crown. So now we're going to take the pelvis out. Egg bone, rage bone. Pelvis, rage bone, yeah. Rage Six bone. one way, half dozen the other. So that's the eye around that kind of sits on the other side of that hole there. You guys notice Sam's just using the tip of his knife to trace that H bone and I'm using his left hand for leverage to pull it away so you're not getting into the meat, keeping the yield as high as possible. I've handled them twice, you know, don't you? What's that? They called the meat off the first time and then you got to handle <laughs> Yeah, that's right. I'm still still working on that myself. So. <laughs> There's your big femur bone right there, the top of the knuckle and the one that connects to the H bone. So what do you do now, Sam? You're just tracing, you're gonna take the... Femur bone out, yeah, just trace around it. Okay. Yeah. And that's gonna leave your outside eye and inside round all in one big piece? Yeah. If you leave this little tab on here, then you got a hand on it. 
Oh, that's a new trick for me too. Gravity do its work too. That replaces the rail, I guess, eh? Yeah, I don't rail break. Everything's on the block. So now we're going to take, split the inside round, the uh, eye round, and outside round off. Okay, are you looking for a particular seam, or you kind of yeah. just know where to go? Well, I've tried to know where I'm going. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Side. That kind of big webby looking stuff lets you know you're in the right spot. Drive round. Outside round. Or inside round. Inside round, outside round. Where I come from, this was top side, silver side, and salmon cut. So is that top side, silver, silver sal side, and salmon cut? Salmon cut. We might have to let that attach to the, to the outside. Left it as one. They call this, I'll show you why they call it silver side. So a big piece of silver skin right down there. I don't know, they call this the heel, is it? Yep. Or I've heard it called the horseshoe muscle before because it's kind of in the shape of a horseshoe there. It's good skew. So what's this fellow want done with uh, his hip muscles? Is he giving steaks, yeah, roast, um, stew? He wants, out of the outside round, he wants minute steaks and ground. And uh, the eye round he wants is roast, and the inside round he wants is roast. Remove all this. Membrane grisly stuff. Where do we need a denuder? Oh? Have you ever seen them? No. You just run it over it and it'll peel all this off. I was wondering how they do that, because I buy denuded eyes yeah. for making jerky out of it. Yeah, not, it's a lot of knife work, but it's uh it's like a Wood planer? Yeah. It's just a like it just a, you just roll it over the surface and there's a gap with a knife that spins and it just takes off. Yeah. So it's a, similar to the thing they use for de-rinding. Bacon and shoulder. Yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, we're carrying on here again with Sam England. Just in case you notice the beef looking any different, my camera died and I had to go back and get a new one. So we're doing another beef on another day, but Sam does them all the same way, so. <laughs> so 
Sam's just prepping the outside round to be roast here and kind of peeling off the dry skin. It's a little bit of a leaner beef, so that outside dries after those hanging days. Uh, would you trim that off if it had a bunch of subcutaneous fat? No, if the, as long as it was clean and yeah, as long as it wasn't dried out, I'd leave the fat on if I could. But right. Very seldom it happens nowadays. Okay. Um, and then everyone's going to want to know your aging process. Uh, 12 to 14 days. Depends on the animal. If it's very lean, it might only end up being 10 days. But as a whole, on a whole, it's 12 to 14 days. If they want it any longer, it costs more money for hanging because it tastes more. Room up in my coolers and I've only got so much cooler space. So. Some people ask for 21 days when it costs them $10 a day for hanging. Personally, I don't know if it makes any difference. Okay. <laughs> when I, was, I learned my trade, we, we did it seven days. Oh? Okay. Well, actually, less than seven. We'd kill on the Monday and we'd have cut the lines up on, on the Wednesday. Right? Okay. We leave the front quarters till the following week, but the hinds will be done the same week. Wow, okay. There's scientific it's proof that anything over seven days is not a waste of time. Age it for seven days and anything after that doesn't make any difference. But everybody's got their own personal preference. And I'm not one to argue with somebody if they want it hanging 21 days. So, Fair enough. As long as the beef can handle it. As long as he's got a good cup of fat on it. There you go. That's the aging process. And that's a, I don't know if you guys noticed that neat little trick. I learned that while I was here. I'm going to start doing it. He tucked his butcher string underneath his apron. And then it's just right there ready to go. I like that. There we go. An outside round roast, all finished up. Yep. So this is the eye round. Let's trim it up the same, just do one roast out of this as well. But it's off a small animal, so we'll be tying two of them together. It just gets a sharp knife just underneath the silver skin, kind of lifting that silver skin up and away from the bulk of the meat and the knife kind of stays as close to the silver skin as possible so you don't have hardly any waste on the on the trimmings all right there's one eye nice trimmed up and sam's doing up the other one there we're going to tie these two eyes together to make a roast they want three to four pound roast so to make it big enough All butchers do knots totally different. Everyone has their own way of doing a knot. I was just thinking that. I was trying to watch how you do it, and I think you put an extra loop in there somehow to me, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Wrap it around, through, tie a knot in the end. Oh, okay, so that's. Pull it tight, and then put another knot, a loop around to lock it. So that second knot you put on there kind of comes down on the first one and keeps it from. Well, in theory, it's supposed to go behind it. So you tighten it up, and then you pull it, and it's in theory supposed to go behind it. But okay, a half hitch that locks it in. Yeah. Okay. And I'm not really smart. I have to use a scale so I can get the blades. I guess then everyone's getting exactly what they wanted, right? Yeah. So I always have a tendency of making them too big. <laughs> that comes from the retail end of things. <laughs> you make them more big. Oh yeah, that'll do. Yeah. <laughs> it's 
so. Okay, and here's the top sirloin and the sirloin tip. Sam just pulled them out of the cooler. That's a nice part about Sam's work. It's your meat never ever warms up. I doubt this meat ever warms up a degree while it's out here. So keeps the meat nice and cold, keeps the quality up. So these are going to be made into roasts. The sirloin tip you can make into steaks, but this customer wants roasts. So. So on the sirloin tip, you kind of peel off the cap and then tie the eye and the other cap together. Yeah. You take that off and then just take the what's left of the sirloin of the tri-tip off, which is the end of the tri-tip. Uh, So lots of times you can kind of save yourself a bit of knife work if you guys seen Sam just did a couple marks on that and you're able to peel most of the cap off with your hands. So that probably helps save your edge over the course of a couple hours of cutting, hey? Yeah. Yeah, it sure does. It's one of those downsized things you have to keep knife sharp. And <laughs> some days it can be a job. Okay, this is new to me, whatever's happening here. That's neat. I've never seen that. So you, you're piercing it about halfway through? Yeah, two thirds. Just keep huh. it together when you put it in a display case. Like I, where I laid my trade, we had a display case and it wasn't that packed or anything, it was just fresh meat laid in it. And it just keeps it together. Huh. Actually, I used to, everything we used to do was always with a needle and it was through, we never wrapped around, we always went through the meat. Really? So it's only since I've come to Canada that we uh, are you aiming good. for any specific thing on there, Sam? Like, so you got the cap and the eye. Are you trying to skewer both of those with the needle when you wrap it, or no, not really. Just to it just holds it together. Okay. It just it's good if you can get past this cap, and then it then it will hold it all together. So it's like if you were to cut again, make us and then because it has a tendency of falling apart. Ah, very neat. And so what you're saying, you do that with whole muscles then? And then those two muscles that you tie together, you obviously had to go around. Yeah. So whenever it's a whole muscle. Well, I do around with this too, because like even with the eye around. Well, there were two muscles too. Well, yeah, I would, on the out, inside round, I go right around. I could go through, but I had a customer complain that she couldn't pull the strings out one time, so. <laughs> okay. When she came to cut after it was cooked, so, and I just started going around. Huh, very cool. This is a sirloin, and this, this little bit is the butt end of the tenderloin, this piece here, and then the sirloin. These, you can make it into steaks or roasts, these people want into roasts. Big roast lovers, these customers. Yeah. So that's the pelvis bone, you're pulling off the butt end of the tenderloin right there, you just trace the pelvis bone a bit. Yeah, just for the tip of the knife. I 
And that fat that sits on top of the tenderloin, that's kind of kidney fat or body yeah. cavity fat. It's no good. No good for kind of barbecuing anyways, I should say. Notice Sam's always pulling the meat away from the bone, trying to leave as much meat on the main muscle as possible and as little on the bone as possible. Using lots of leverage, the muscle falls away from the bone that way. He's pulling with his left hand, cutting with his right hand. There's your default. Oh, oh, look at that. Smooth, but it's deformed. So we won't be trimming too much off that one. And that's because he broke his pelvis at some point in time, yeah, probably? He got injured when he was younger, yeah. When he was a calf, probably. Now I think the other day you were showing me, for the first time, you save that little piece when you're doing your own beef, right? And you just flash fry it really hot and it's really good? Uh, yeah, it's underneath here. I'm underneath sure. yet, okay, okay. This is the piece here, it's a tri-tip. Not many people know really what to do with tri-tip here. But it's an up and coming thing. I see now Costco sell tri-tip. It is very tasty to barbecue. You make steaks out of it. You even make it to jerk, but you just cook it. Trim it up and cook it as a roast. It's on the barbecue. It's really good. Okay. Is it a little tougher, like a slow cook material? or? No, not really. You cook it about 350 until it gets to, I don't know, 140. Eat it medium, medium well. And, but it swells up and it really is tasty. There you go. It's big in the, in the down in the U.S., especially down in Texas and places like that. They like it, so. So this little muscle here. Depends where you come from in the world, they call it a, a, rump, a rump pillar, as in pillowcase, in down in the Australia. And in some parts of the US they call it a mouse steak. <laughs> so it's just a little, you just trim the silver side off and just cook it really hot, really fast, and it's pretty tasty. The mouse or the pillow steak, that's a, another one I learned. But it's burger here today in Alberta. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to worry about that shit. We don't have to worry about being spoiled. So then this is going to be made into roast, so we'll just trim the sort of skin off. So it can be made into steaks just by slicing it like that. But say this customer wants it into roasts. Do you separate the cap when you do steaks? Yeah. <laughs> no, not very often. Once in a while, but not, not usually. It's another thing that's not that common in the Alberta. But I think in the seven years I've been going, I've only had one guy order the cap off the top sirloin cap. I find them myself a little bit better than the main muscle, I think, yeah. but. Actually, I see, also Costco's now selling them. Okay. Yeah, I saw that, I was there a couple of weeks back and I saw them. So Sam just finished up the top sirloin here and he's. Just separating them out so that when the wife comes to wrap, she'll get confused. 
And it's nice, again, the meat's never in the cutting room for more than a few minutes at a time, so. Better sneak out before I get locked in. We got lucky timing. Sam's smokehouse just went off while we're here, so we get to, he said he's making some smokies. What's the name for smokies in England? Like it's something you, huh, ah, okay. No, it didn't, didn't do much, like, there is obviously the little smoke stuff in England, but not like there is here. Like, big pepperonis for pizza and all that, but there's maybe a little more nowadays, but when I was there, I didn't, I've never had pepperonis or salami, or, like there's the dry cured salamis, but smokies, no, nothing like that. There was hot dogs, but <laughs> they weren't that good, so. Those look good. He's also running the pro smoker. Doing some temperature checking. Just going to trim the tenderloin up. They want it leaving in a piece. You can cut it into steaks too, but these will be pretty small steaks, so we're just leaving it in a whole piece. Well, I guess it's a half a piece because the whole tender one will be this long. So yeah. This is the wide end that's kind of closer to the pelvis. It tapers down as you get closer to the ribs. I'm going to take a guess that your opinion of the tenderloins, probably like all other butchers' opinion of the tenderloin, it's overrated. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, I would rather not. Yeah. There's way more nice cuts to eat than tenderloin. I'd rather eat the tri-tip than the tenderloin. Okay, I was just going to ask, what if you had uh, an afternoon to cook a steak and have a beer, what, what would your cut be? If I had my choice, it'd be an oyster steak. Really? But I wouldn't need the afternoon, I wouldn't even need a beer. <laughs> it's cooked so fast. Yeah. <laughs> and then it would be the prime rib and the, and the ribeye. Okay. Well, for normal steaks that everybody else can get on, the uh, prime rib or the ribeye would be my favorite. I've yet to have an oyster steak myself. I knew which cut it was, but I, I don't know. I just don't custom cut beef, so I never have the chance to get them. Yeah, you do. I, I don't think I've ever seen them in a store or anywhere to buy. So. I can't remember if we went over the oyster steak when we were breaking them. I think yeah, we, we did. did. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we did. It's, it's just, yeah, just one of them things. If you don't know where it is, you, you know, most people just throw it into ground beef. <laughs> I don't know where I was raised. It was a pretty poorer part of the world and all of England and that working class and they used the cheaper cuts for more things than the expensive cooks, so a lot of stew meats and crazy steaks and things like that. I don't think I had a T-bone steak until I was 21 years old. <laughs> <coughs> oh, well, I might get out of the way. <coughs> just want to stop in there, I want to have smoke, is that here we are, the smokies are finished up. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let it cool down a bit. That's a pretty cool setup he's got. He's got a cooler designated to the fully cooked smokies and it just goes straight in out of the smokehouse. That's pretty dang good looking batch. Yeah, it's filmed. So these are, this is my recipe, but you've added some things. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can guess what Sam's added. See how good my taste buds were. That's very good. <laughs> I have no idea. What'd you change? I put black pepper in as well. Oh, okay. Oh, this is the Bavarians. Yeah. Okay. Just put black. Put white and black in. I like black pepper. Yeah, that's dang good. Well done, Sam. 
Okay, so Sam's about to get started on the front. This is probably the half of the beef the home butchers struggle with the most, so we'll pay attention. I'm just trimming off where it was stuck, sticking like, where it was, the throat was cut. So we start the shin, so a lot of people do these differently. This is all manual, the way I do it. So you just gotta go around, try and hit the joint there. Putting downward pressure on the shin helps open the joint up. So you come around, yeah. And then it comes off just like that. And again, you can cut this up into soup bones, slice it up, cut through it. But then you guys don't want it, so it's just going into ground. Or you can make it into stew meat too. It makes really good stew meat and soup because of all the connective tissue and this all the dust so it just melts down and makes it really tasty. That's a bit of a tricky joint to break. How many did you have to break before you were doing it smoothly like that? Well, I don't know. Quite a few. Sometimes, even today, you still, even now I come across some that are nigh impossible to break. I have to put a saw across them. Not very many. Then we're going to take the, I guess, collarbone out. So this is the collarbone. And we're going to put an eye and follow the bone around until you get to the end of it, which is here, where the joint is. This joint here is where it joins the shoulder blade. Okay, see so trace the bone there. This is just usually ground and stew meat. I seen that cut up the other day into it was labeled Thor's hammer. <laughs> so actually, we uh, you can make a Thor's hammer out of the shit. So, so uh, you can make a Thor's hammer out of this too. You would cut it off here with a saw, and then cut the the knuckle off, and then round here you would trim it off. So then you would have a. Okay, so it's kind of like, uh, like, oh, cool. <laughs> so then it's like that, and this is a hat, and so it looks like a hammer. So this is a handle. Uh, it works better with a hind shin. Huh. Yeah, I've never really made them. I've seen them made. <laughs> I'm glad you knew what that was. That was the first time I'd seen it, and that was just last week, so. <laughs> and you can do it with a, with a pace shin too, the hind huh. shins. Yeah. When you were a kid, your mum always told you never to cook towards yourself. <laughs> that law sort of goes out with butchering. I've been butchering since I was 16 years old, and it's only the last three years I've been wearing chainmail. And I never stabbed myself. Really? In my stomach. What about your fingers? You got any stitches in the hands? A few. <laughs> okay. I actually only started wearing a glove a year ago. Okay. I know to that I never wore a glove. I know some guys say it bugs them, they lose their dexterity. They cut with a couple guys that were like that. But. You know, you take... The trouble is wearing a glove is now I would never not wear a glove. Because you take too many risks. Because you know you've got the glove on. So you know you've got protection. Mm. So you don't have a glove on, you're still going to take them risks. And it's... Uh, yeah. I know, I work here alone, and I just, 
design I should probably start wearing some protection just in case. And the wife likes it too. So. <laughs> happy wife, happy life. So yeah, that's true. Trust me. <laughs> so this is the neck. We're just gonna debun the neck out. People do this differently. Sorry, Sam. People do it differently. Okay. So, like, people will take the whole bone out together. But because I'm different than most people, <laughs> we'll take them out individually. Okay. I don't know, was it like this in England? I know when I was starting, they would throw all the new guys the neck and the flank. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, the first thing I ever did was a, a flank. <laughs> yeah. So just with the tip of your knife, you just go through the joints. Sheesh, that's a clean neck bone. I'm not saying much, Sam, because I'm gobsmacked. That's pretty clean and pretty quick, and they're using a tricky method, I would say. Look at that. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> Sam's going in to clean the one ounce that's left on there. I guarantee you any other custom meat cutting shop would have left a pound on your neck and thrown it in the gut tub. Well, I'm too old fashioned to set in my ways. So we're going to break the rest of it down. We're going to take the thick cross rib off. So you mark by the shoulder blade bone and then at the end of so connect the dots. Take the cross rib out just to the seam. Then we'll separate the short ribs from the brisket. These guys don't want short ribs so we can make the brisket a little bigger. These guys want the brisket, so we 
just use the point end, so we'll put three ribs off. That bit of ground, and then this is for the smoked brisket. Now we'll remove the blade bone from the chuck. Do you have a favorite part of the beef you like working on? Mm. Mm. Not really. I, I like working on Actually, no, I, all of it's the same. Yeah. Uh, shins are sometimes a pain in the butt to cut up. It's got so much gristle in them. But no, not usually. I like working on this blade. I like seeing the different, there's so many different ways that guys pull this off. I like working on it. That's my favorite piece. Oh, nice clean blade bone. So we basically started on one side, traced out the flat iron and mock tender. What do you call those two cuts? Yeah, the mock tender and then this is the flat iron. Okay. But very seldom we have to save them. It usually just goes into stew meat or ground. But it can be cut up into steaks or you can roll it and make it into pot roast. I didn't even put a hole in it. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> 10 points. <laughs> so. Then again, this one you can take it out in a whole piece or you can take them out individually. So Sam's just tracing each one, finding the space between the two vertebrae. Making it look easy as he does it. It's not easy. And kind of pulling away using the leverage on the bone and leaving a maximum amount of meat on that main muscle. Just trimming the chuck up here. Take this gristle, the yellow thing out. Well, Duncan calls a party whack or something. <laughs> I think so, yeah. <laughs> So the chuck you can be made into roast, steaks, stew, or ground. I would, if it was mine, I would make it into roasts, pot roasts. Okay. But this customer doesn't want it in anything else but ground. Too bad. And then this is just taking the, the flat iron and the mock tender off, but you can actually roll that together and make a real pot roast, trim it up a bit, or trim these up and you can get your flat iron steaks out of there. The flat iron's increasing in popularity, hey? Yeah, it is. I, was, uh, I actually had my first one two weeks ago in a restaurant in Silver Lake. Okay. And it was good. <laughs> so then I'm just showing you how we would trim it up if it was going to, in to be roast. So we just sort of like square it off. That bit can go into ground. And then we just take these, what the professionals call bone skin, off. So that's kind of the extension of the ribeye coming down the middle of the, the back there. It kind of tapers off and doesn't, not much yet. Yeah. There's the ribeye muscle right there and it shrinks as it goes down that muscle. So you can make it into steaks. 
Like that? I'll roll it and make it into roasts. Or burger. Or burger. So I'm going to do the prime rib. So prime rib, you can do it on the bone as a roast. We just take the chine bone off, leave the ribs in, and take the end of the blade bone out, and put a couple of pieces of string around it, or you can uh, debone it and roll it and make it into roast. Well, this customer wants prime rib steaks, so we'll make it into prime rib steaks. Remove the cap off it. That cap makes bloody good little steak bites too. Yeah, it probably would. <laughs> and then just fall the rib bones down. This was one we were allowed to burn out this way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not individually. <laughs> then we just trim her up to make it into steaks, take the flap it off and then get rid of this yellow stuff. Gristle. And we'll cut it in steaks. That looks beautiful. Nice lean beef. Not too much marbling on this guy, I guess. But Pretty young animal. It was, was had an in injury lame leg, so rather than lose their shirt at the auction mat, they decided to butcher it themselves. There we go, the primary steaks. Just going to make this, trim this up into for ground. Clean it up, get rid of the fat and the gristle. The rest of it can go in the ground. The cleanest grind you'll ever find. Yeah, you push it in there, don't you? <laughs> Do the brisket for... They want to use it for smoking, so... Seems to be all the rage these days. <laughs> I don't blame him, it's pretty tasty. Years ago, before the, when I learned to do butchering, we used to roll this and make it into a pot roast. Going it out and make pot roast out of it, so. Or they make corned beef out of it, right? Yep. And, <clears throat> is it, that was that pickle, the stuff. Yep, pastrami is another cut for it, yeah. yeah. Impressions they cut another method of doing it. We uh, last week made some peppered beef bacon for a fellow out of it. Brought some briskets in and never. I've, I've always wanted to try that. I've never tried it yet. You kind of got to get out of your mind that it's going to taste just like bacon because it's too different from pork. Yeah, it yeah. was. It was good. It was, I, it was I, like pastrami, yeah. I guess. Like I've had it, but I've never made it. Actually, no, I've never had beef. I bison bacon. Yeah, you know, both bison. One uh, of these days I'll get around to doing it. If only I had time. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of the midline he took off there. That's where you might have some contamination from the and it kiln. Darkened, and it darkens up too. Yeah. And it's where the saw goes through, so there's can be saw dust on it and that. So yeah. There, I'll just trim it and off and throw it away. Now we're just going to trim trim the inside fat and gristle off. People, different people, trim their briskets differently. Some people. I've seen people actually smoke the whole brisket just like that. Going in? Yeah. That'd be, add some flavor, that could be good. Well, it took 17 hours to cook. Okay. <laughs> well, it would be interesting to try it. As again, if we ever had time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, like and subscribe to the video so we make a bunch of money and we can just play around with meat all day. Yeah. <laughs> That's looking pretty close to what you see in the supermarket now. This animal's not very fat, so there's not overabundance to trim off, so. But I like to when I do a brisket for customers, I like to have it so they can just season it and throw it on the grill so they don't even have to trim it or anything. It's just ready for them to do it. No wonder you're booked up a year in advance. <laughs> there is a baby brisket. Very nice. Now we're going to do the cross rib. Cross rib can be made into roast, steak, uh, stew meat, or ground, or stir fry. But this customer wants it into roast, so we'll trim it up for us. There's kind of a seam there with a bunch of side muscles that's attached to that kind of main cross rib muscle, and you can find, and Sam just peels it off and continues to clean it up. So if you was wanted to make it into steaks, you would just cut them like that. But say this one's going to be made into roast. So. Do you always start at the largest portion? Middle. Kind of work, just middle and out? Well, 95% of the time. A little bit. And we have a cross rib roast. Mm -hmm. It looks good. Now we just trim the bones off. It's a little bit of a tricky one, hey? The yeah, bone. If you get too aggressive, you end up cutting the cartilage off the soft bones. Yeah. And that's, you don't want that. So basically, we're going to just, Sam's going to, I'm not going to do it, <laughs> trim up all these kind of off cuts or short ribs and whatnot, and that's all going for ground, right? Yeah. Ground or sausage, but they don't need any sausage, so we're just all into ground. So, yeah, bit by bit, he's just going to go through them and knock the meat off the bone and knock some of that drier, shiny meat between each rib off because it shows up in your ground a little bit. And that'll be the end of the chuck, I think, won't it? Is there any more pieces on the sorry, front quarter? No, nope, that's it. Let's say this is a short rib, but everything else is just chin, neck, and the chuck that needs to cut it up into the ground. Shin. Okay. The rest is just, just going to be ground. Okay, so Sam's been working away on the ribs and the plate there, and this is kind of what he's producing. Pretty nice, clean trim out of the lots of silver skin and connective tissue in the plate, so that is nice trim. Something like that. <laughs> okay. 
and weighs two pieces of string. Three pieces. <laughs> okay. So Sam just finished up on the ribs and whatnot, and he's just going to tie this uh, sure. chuck roast into. Well, these people want it into burger, but he's just going to show us what it looks like as a roast. As I said earlier, personally, I would make it into a roast. Cause, so cook it slowly. It's just like pulled beef. It's really tasty. So kind of as a general rule of thumb, the more the animal uses it, the more kind of connective tough tissues it have, but that makes it more flavorful if you cook it slow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing is, uh, you have to have the time to, patience to cook it slowly. But sometimes time is, you lose most people. As long as you're in a rush to get it done, so. go but you can focus here so you can kind of see in this you can see those little bits of marble and those lines that go through the meat that's kind of collagen that's that connective stuff but it equals lots of flavor that's why the brisket's so yummy the beef's pulling itself along with its front leg and using that pectoral muscle and that's what makes briskets and chucks so yummy if you cook them slow and low but Sam's just knocking these into ground today for these folks they need a little extra ground beef in the freezer all right, so this is the very last of the beef. Sam's cleaning up the last of the trim off the chuck for these folks. And that unbelievably nice trim pile. So, is there any closing notes for the people on YouTube, Sam? Not really. Just, there's no rocket science to it. <laughs> I know I've been doing it a lot of years, but uh, just sharp knives. Keep them away from your fingers. <laughs> okay. Sharp knives and keep them away from your fingers. Well, thank you very much, Mr. England, for having us. We appreciate it. It's like the first episode of the Meat World's Diner Drive-Ins and Dives, I think. Oh, <laughs> episode number one. I don't have the Camaro yet. No? <laughs> this show, uh, This show's budget would be a pedal bike right now, but... Yeah, pretty expensive, but... <laughs> okay, well, thanks again, Sam. You're welcome.